all persons having business before the Honorable Associate Judges, now presiding over the District of Columbia Court of Appeals, draw near and give your attention. God save this United States and this Honorable Court. This Honorable Court is now in session. Please come to order. Thank you. Good afternoon. We have uh, two cases on the calendar this afternoon. And after the first case, uh, the panel will reconstitute and proceed with the second case. So the first case is Jason Kolowski versus District of Columbia, number 18 CV 783. Council, Ms. Murphy. You're on mute. mute. That does seem to be the hardest thing to get used to. Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon, your honors, and may it please the court. Uh, my name is Donna Murphy, and I am appearing on behalf of the appellant, Jason Kalaus Kalowski, in this matter. Uh, I respectfully request the court allow me to reserve three minutes uh, for rebuttal. Mm -hmm. This appeal addresses, uh, comes before the court and addresses several issues. Uh, the first issue is whether the trial court erred in granting summary judgment in favor of the District of Columbia when it ruled that the appellant, Dr. Kalowski, failed to adduce competent evidence in support of his prima facie case of retaliation pursuant to the District of Columbia Whistleblower Protection Act. Specifically, the court ruled that the temporal proximity of uh, the temporal proximity um, that there was no dispute exists because of that based on temporal proximity, there was no dispute that existed on the issue of causation. Uh, while the trial court did not proceed to the issue and did not decide the issue, it has been argued on appeal as to if a prima facie case is issued, whether there's a triable issue. Um, and it was actually uh, argued in the lower court as to the district's proffered reason, independent and uh, innocent reason for termination. Uh, the second issue concerns the trial, whether the trial court abused its discretion by allowing the district to conduct an out of time deposition while disallowing Dr. Kalowski to take a duly noticed deposition of relevant decision makers, despite the ongoing agreement of the parties to allow both out of time depositions throughout the litigation. As to the first issue, both the timing and the circumstances of the of, this, of the entire circumstances and the temporal proximity provide the totality of facts that demonstrate that the appellant did in fact present sufficient evidence to support a prima facie case. Ms. Murphy, what, what evidence, um, the other circumstances are you primarily relying on outside of the uh, temporal proximity? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the, primarily the circumstances as a whole and the timing of the way everything happened is circumstantial evidence to support the prima facie case. The entire circumstance was a two week period. And there is evidence presented that in this two week period as the Department of Forensic Science and if you'll excuse me if I refer to it as DF DFS for, for uh, simplicity, that as DFS was losing its, has lost its credibility and there was a major managerial shakeup, there were a number of members who were kept on and who were assured by the deputy mayor, uh, Kevin Donahue, that their positions were secure. This why, were they, why were they assured by the deputy mayor, right? I mean, my understanding is that Dr. Mitchell is appointed to head up DFS. So what, what is the deputy mayor doing, injecting himself in this? The deputy mayor was the, the person who was Introdu introducing the members who were still there to Dr. Mitchell and was overseeing everything that was going on through this transition. But, While, but was he was he Dr. Mitchell's supervisor? I mean, is there any indication that he had sort of the final say so? And I don't think that there's any indication that there was final say so, but in the transition point, there was a uh, testimony from Dr. Kalowski, I believe in his deposition, that during that transition, the deputy mayor was overseeing parts of the transition and getting people into place. Um, there is not a, it is not the contention that the deputy mayor was the decision maker here. Um, all along the contention has been that it was Dr. Mitchell was the decision maker, but that was but one circumstance. Um, 
there, the circumstances are that on May 4th, the day that Mr. K that Dr. Kalowski returned to the office, he was promoted to a new position and took on new responsibilities, overseeing the uh, coordination of getting all of the untested kits out of the door and to a third party vendor. That, Ms. that Ms. Ms. Murphy, I don't think I follow the reasoning as to why the two factors you've mentioned, namely the deputy mayor's reassurance of the people who were working there and the promotion of Dr. Kalowski. I'm not sure I understand how those factors go to establish the key point, whether um, Dr. Mitchell knew about um, uh, Dr. Kalowski's protected disclosure at the time of the decision to terminate Dr. Kalowski. Um, the, 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 the government's, you know, he, he has given us an affidavit saying, I didn't know about it. I terminated, I lost confidence in his uh, competence uh, after he gave me this misinformation. Um, I, I don't understand how prior fact about his elevation to the position with new responsibilities uh, that occurred before that and the um, deputy mayor's reassurance provided to the staff, how, how those things bear on the question. Your Honor, they bear on the question because of the order in which everything happened and the, the temporal proximity of the disclosure to the termination were extraordinarily close and within a overall context that was extremely fluid. And but that so, might, I'm sorry to interrupt certainly. Ms. Murphy, but that, that might bear on the question of whether there's a causal relationship, right? If, if we knew that Dr. Mitchell knew, then, then the timing between the disclosure and the termination um, might have significant weight in, in showing causation. But, you know, I reiterate Judge Glickman's question. I'm not sure that I see the, the inference that you're asking us to draw that this timing shows knowledge. Well, Your Honor, under the, um, the case of Jones v. Bernanke, there is, that's 557 F3D 670 2009, um, that, that persuasively shows that a, uh, an action, a retaliatory action that happens in short order after a protected disclosure is in fact supportive evidence that is supportive of an inference of knowledge. Um, it is also allowed as inference of retaliatory motive. And because retaliatory motive is the intent and that it that is tied to the knowledge of the decision maker. That's where this it is so key that the timing in this matter and the order and events would happen. Um, the, low, the trial court relied heavily, um, as does the district, on the, the McFarland, Johnson, and Payne cases to demonstrate that temporal proximity is not sufficient to raise that inference. However, in those cases, the, the order in which events happen and the time frame of that proximity are very, very different than the case here. And Let me ask you a, a question, Ms. Murphy. Suppose um, a, an, this is a hypothetical, Certainly. But, but, but it's to illustrate a, a point, I think. Suppose an employee makes a protective disclosure and one day after the employee makes that protective disclosure, the head of the agency fires that employee and says, I've lost confidence in you. You might say, well, that's pretty significant. Suppose you knew, however, that in that one day period, it has been discovered that the employee was robbing money from the till or doing something you know, equally problematic, was discriminating on, on a racial basis against other employees, was doing a million things that, and if you investigated it, you would discover yeah, well, it is an interesting coincidence that this occurred one day after. But we know darn well that the real reason that the employee was fired was for this misconduct. 
the point of my hypothetical is that I don't think anybody is saying that temporal proximity is irrelevant to the inquiry into whether there was um, uh, knowledge and causation, not necessarily irrelevant, but yeah, you have to look at it in the totality of the circumstances and it only goes, it may only go so far. And here we have a lot of other circumstances to consider besides that. Does that hypothetical make sense to you or do you, or would, or would you say even in the hypothetical I've given you, um, the temporal proximity alone would entitle the employee to get past summary judgment? Well, in, in that circumstance, Your Honor, there's an intervening event that is discovered. Uh, a, well, that's what we're a talking theft about here. Or an too. improper action. There's that's no- That's what we're talking about here too. Well, the, the intervening it, it, event here is the um, misinformation provided by Dr. Kalowski to Dr. Mitchell. Well, the intervening, actually, that, I think that this case is different because the record evidence that's submitted with the summary judgment, there's a number of emails that actually indicate that the, that well, the district concedes that they don't know when the, the, the Dr. Mitchell made the decision. Um, the reason proffered was the, an error in information related to a May 4th hearing, but the record ev evidence itself shows emails that Dr. Mitchell had that evidence that, he, that those numbers that he used at the hearing the morning of the 4th that was provided by someone completely distinct from Dr. Kalowski. Does Dr. the record indicate, actually, I thought the record did not indicate uh, with precision in other words, affirmatively, who provided that information. The inference from Dr. Mitchell's affidavit is that he believed he got it from Mr. Kalowski, excuse me, excuse me Dr. Kalowski. And Dr. Kalowski has not, if I understand correctly, denied that. No, that's not exactly no right. Or affidavit or the am I wrong about that? It's slightly different than that. There's evidence, there are emails submitted in the record that show that, that Dr. Mitchell was discussing information about the, the numbers that he testified to that afternoon at the city council hearing. And that email was hours before Dr. Kalowski was ever asked to get involved with the collection of that information. Dr. Kalowski was not involved in the request to generate any information until about noon when he received an email that indicated there was a request for information by one o'clock and that there was no indication of what that information was related to. In Dr. Kalowski's declaration, he further states that he was never informed that any request was specifically for the council hearing. Further, there is, in, there is record evidence uh, in- But in, excuse me, but even if that is true, even if you're right about all that, what we still have is a situation that, even if it was after the council hearing, Dr. Kalowski provided misinformation to, to Dr. Mitchell and then retracted it, I think a day or two later, I've forgotten the timing exactly, but uh, am I right about that? Um, it, it close, Your Honor. Um, what it, what happened was there was a request for a collection of information. There's emails that indicate that Dr. Kalowski provided that information on May 6th, um, that he testified in both his, I believe in his um, his deposition, he just, he explained that he was no longer running the DNA lab. So he was relying on other people and people who no longer worked at the lab for, to collect information. So he was gathering information from sources that he could get available to. There was no indication to him that those numbers were incorrect. And then the very next day when he received additional information that added a handful of additional kits, he immediately corrected the numbers. In fact, the information and the correction, he says in that email, please disregard yesterday's draft and then updates that. And all of the circumstances indicate that there was a tremendous amount of chaos going on at the time. And then subsequent to that, there is the disclosure. And then right on the heels of that, 
there is the termination. So there is no, and there was never at any point throughout there, any indication that Dr. Mitchell was dissatisfied with the information that he was receiving from Dr. Kalowski or that there was any corrective action suggested about any information. And all of and all of the information. I'm having, but but but, but right. I mean, you, you you could argue that Dr. Mitchell, um, perhaps, uh, was too harsh. Be that as it may, I don't know how this argument that you're making relates to the question of whether Dr. Mitchell knew about knew knew about the protective disclosure. Well, ultimately, what what seemed to happen in the trial court is that all other evidence that supports the inference, the temporal proximity available inference, all the evidence around that was simply not considered. Randy Wampler submitted a declaration verifying and corroborating exactly what Dr. Kalowski said that everyone was or was directed and this goes back to some of the information provided by Deputy Mayor Donahue in the introduction to Dr. Mitchell that and I'm sorry I'm out of time but I'd be happy to finish the, the question um, that the that everything was to be run up the flagpole that everything was to be was to be reported because the entire arena was in crisis. So there's reasonable inference there that general counsel upon receiving information that firearms were making their way back out of, of a secure location into the community, there's a reasonable inference there that that it's is- sort of, It's sort of interesting though, Ms. Murphy, that this is an interesting case because we're really talking about knowledge as opposed to, you know, causation, whether whether Mr. Uh, Dr. Mitchell, Mr. Mitchell um, terminated your client um, as a result of this information. And I'm wondering if you have, is there a case, I, the cases that we have tend to be like, I was looking at one Tyrone Bryant where it's, you know, there is a temporal proximity issue and it, um, and it matters there and it's relevant, but it's also, there's also information that a supervisor had knowledge of the, the relevant information and that the supervisor had been in touch with the person who did the terminating, you know, so knowledge wasn't really the, the issue. It was like, you know, it was, it was more of a causation issue. Are, is there a case law where you have temporal proximity um, carrying so much weight in the face of a sworn declaration of, I did not know. Your Honor, I can again point you to the Jones v. Bernanke, also Massaquai v. District of Columbia, that's 285 F SUP 3D 82, um, as persuasive. In both of those cases, the time difference between the disclosure and the adverse action was a month, and it was deemed to be very relevant and very persuasive in both of those circumstances. Um, and, and to survive summary judgment because of the nature of retaliation, these sorts of, the, the courts there found that the nature of these sorts of circumstances are fairly opaque and, and rarely lend themselves to direct evidence. So it is cir the circumstances and the totality of the circumstances that are so important to consider. And when a termination, when an adverse action is so close on the heels of the disclosure, that that alone is evidence of knowledge. That alone I, is evidence. Can I ask a, a factual question about the nature of the disclosure? The disclosure had to do with the um, MPD's firearm database. Is correct. that correct? Correct, which, which had subsequently which was defunct. At that point it was, um, but, but that there were cases where a, a firearm had been entered into the prior database, but then showed up in the current database. There were no cases where the current database had, had duplicates. Right, and I guess sort of just on this kind of totality of the circumstances view, you know, I guess, What's it to DFS if cases that have been logged in by the MPD and put into their database 
are then showing up and being logged into. I mean, certainly it's of concern. DFS wants to take note of it, but it doesn't seem to point towards um, misconduct by DFS. It seems to point to historical misconduct by MPD. And so that, if I'm understanding this correctly, that would seem to be kind of a less forceful reason for anyone at DFS to um, be um, have their feathers ruffled by this. Well, the, my, Am I the, misunderstanding basic facts? The, the responsibility that had previously been MPDs for that process was subsumed by DFS. So there was an ongoing process there in place so, and so there was certainly a concern that if this had happened in the past, and there is testimony in J and uh, Ms. Dr. Klauski's, um, that in his deposition that he took corrective action, maybe just a few, when he discovered this, which was just a few months prior to make sure that these sorts of things didn't happen again. So there was still the open possibility that if it had not been caught, that, that firearms could still be making their way back into the community, which is certainly an issue of danger to the community and public safety. Well, I want to press you on that, if I may, Miss, Miss Murphy, because I want to be sure my own understanding of these facts is correct. I have understood that Dr. Kalaus, I mean, because the issue is, is this the kind of information that in the hurly-burly of this chaos that you described involving the DNA, that the general counsel who's just been on, come on board, Mr. Hildrum, um, would have alerted uh, Dr. Mitchell to. Uh, it's interesting that Dr. Kalowski didn't alert Dr. Mitchell to, it. She may say something. But um, what I understand is that we're now in the year 2000 and, uh, what is it, 15? Correct. And Dr. Kalowski is saying, you know, in the period from 2000, something like 2010 to 2012, over at the police department, there were these, th this problem in the day in their database. And that came to my attention and I checked and he tells doctor, and he tells Mr. Hildrum that we don't have that problem here. I, uh, he didn't say anything about, we had it and I cured it. He says, we don't have, I look, we don't have that problem. That's a problem that dates back to 2012 at the police department. And while I, I accept that reporting that falls within the definition of a protected disclosure, it's sort of like hard to understand why, given that it's old news about a different agency and that the, the person who learned about it and is investigated and this agency doesn't have this problem, why, why, how, why, why we should infer that it's the kind of information that Mr. Hildrum would have felt necessary to bring to Dr. Mitchell's attention, particularly at this particular time when they're, you know, when it's all hands on deck to deal with the DNA crisis. You see what I'm saying? I, I do. Do I, do I misunderstand the facts of this thing? Well, I would, I would respond with a couple of items, Your Honor. Um, the first is that I think that there's an overarching concern that, that, there were, you know, firearms making their way back into the community. And I think that would be an ongoing. I think also it's important to note that when this first occurred, Dr. Kalowski went through the chain of command and, and submitted his reports to Christine Funk, who was the prior general counsel. Christine Funk has submitted a declaration. There's a difference though. That's when he was in, first of all, she's no longer there, but, that, but, but the, the big difference I think is that's when, when Dr. Klauski was investigating. He That's completed then. his, excuse me, or he may have he just com completed it. So, all right, but now it's old news. Well, it I was mean, only completed a few old... months prior. Uh, she, he submitted the, he submitted his reports for the 60 instances that he was able to identify and submitted them all to Christine Funk in early 2015. Then in late April, Actually, it's not clear she told, and, and it's not clear Christine Funk told the director at that time, did it, is it? 
It, it is, Your Honor. She, Christine Funk submitted a declaration in support of summary judgment where she indicates that she left a list of open legal issues. Um, oh, when, oh, she, when was, she left, that's right. When she left, right. she left a handwritten of, of all the open legal issues for her successor. Um, and in Dr. Kalowski's deposition, he indicates that this was not the only issue that he was speaking to Mr. Hildum about. There were other I legal take it issues that, there's that he no identifies. Evidence that, I take it that there is no evidence that Ms. Funk's list of open issues was brought to the attention of Dr. Mitchell. I, I don't think anybody addressed that. We've given you a little extra time uh, and we did that deliberately. Um, let us hear from counsel for the government and we'll give you a few minutes in rebuttal. Yes, sir. Ms. Johnson. Good afternoon. May it please the court. Holly Johnson for the District of Columbia. Um, I want to start by talking about Jones. None of the cases uh, cited by Mr. Kalowski say that uh, temporal proximity itself is evidence of decision maker knowledge. And Jones itself, Jones has three examples within it, and then there are two other cases cited by Kalowski. And all of those cases refer to circumstantial evidence that stretches beyond the temporal proximity itself. And all of those cases say that um, the circumstantial evidence can come from other sources, such as every single one of these cases, a formal complaint either filed with an administrative agency or with or a official lawsuit that is served upon the agency and that that provided some of the circumstantial evidence. There's no case cited by uh, Kalowski or, or that I was able to find that indicates that when any person at an agency knows about a protected activity or protected disclosure, that that can suffice to create an inference of knowledge itself. So if you look at Jones, in that case, there was a formal EEO complaint and affidavits were required to, in response from two of the decision makers. So they must have known about the complaint. In Holcomb v. Powell, cited in Jones, there was a district court lawsuit and two administrative complaints. In Roshan v. Gonzalez, cited in Jones, there were two lawsuits that were settled by the employer. And in Singletary, there was an official OHR charge and an appeal to this court. So there was circumstantial evidence in those cases that the employer knew. I will also note that in none of those cases um, where the circumstantial evidence existed, was there direct testimony by the decision maker, where the decision maker said, I didn't have knowledge of the protected disclosure. Uh, in Massacoy, which is a district court case uh, in the District of Columbia, the plaintiff reported the, the discrimination. This was a, a the protected activity was the disclosure of the the complaint of discrimination. Reported that to the supervisor, and that supervisor took the first act of retaliation. And in Kralowak, which is a Maryland district court case, there was again a formal administrative complaint and actual testimony against one of the decision makers. And in that case, one of the supervisors admitted that he might have known. And as uh, you know, one of the judges here has pointed to Bryant, and again, Bryant, the supervisor who recommended the termination, knew of the protected activity, and there was a direct chain of conversation between that supervisor and the decision maker about firing that plaintiff. And it was under those circumstances that this court found that the evidentiary burden had been met. In this Ms. case, Johnson, yes. Um, does it matter? I think you mentioned um, that, um, you know, none of those cases have direct testimony. Um, by the decision maker, does it matter that Dr. Mitchell only submitted a declaration that we don't actually have a deposition of him or testimony? Is that relevant? No, that's completely irrelevant. The reason why there's no testimony of Dr. Mitchell is that the plaintiff did not seek his deposition. He was a fact witness. He was available for the entire 14 months that discovery was open. So was Mr. Hildum. They both are still employed by the District of Columbia. And fact witnesses were never even noticed. 
Um, so no, it, it doesn't matter. And indeed, as long as the testimony is consistent, even if there is a deposition, introducing a declaration at summary judgment qualifies as evidence just as any other evidence would. In fact, Mr. Kalowski submitted an, a declaration um, at, uh, at summary judgment in addition to already having been deposed. So the case that I would like to point this court to, the case that is most on point to the circumstance here, is the DC Circuit case Talavera v. Shaw. In that case, the adverse action was taken eight Excuse days. Me, I beg your pardon, Ms. Johnson. There was some, there was a little background noise. What, what was the? <laughs> I apologize. I didn't catch the I'm also I didn't talking catch too fast for Zoom. No, um, <laughs> right. I didn't catch the case. I didn't catch the case that you were speaking to. It's Talavera v. Shaw, and I'm going to take that as a reminder to slow down. Um, oh. Talavera v. Shaw, it's cited in my brief, um, and it's a D.C. Circuit case. In that case, the adverse action was taken eight days after the plaintiff told two of her supervisors about her protected activity. The decision maker, she introduced evidence, worked closely with those two supervisors and talked to those two supervisors about personnel matters on a regular basis. And yet the decision maker said he didn't know about the protected activity and the DC circuit held that a reasonable jury would have to speculate to find that he did. The way this court has established the test for the difference between a reasonable inference and impermissible speculation is to look at the evidence and say, is the opposite inference just as likely? And if it's just as likely that you could make the opposite inference, then it's speculation, not a reasonable inference. And here it is just as likely based on these allegations that are out there that Mr. That, that Dr. Mitchell did not know about the protected activity. Uh, indeed, it, given his own testimony that he did not, which we have to accept as true, uh, it is undisputed that he did not know. And if he did not know about the protected disclosure, no amount of temporal proximity is going to satisfy that test. If this court looks at McFarland on note 10, in that case, the plaintiff argued that shortly after he made an independent protected activity, which was a letter complaining about his non-selection for a promotion, shortly after that, the adverse action was taken. It was five days in that case, so truly shortly after. And what this court said is, that doesn't matter here because first, the plaintiff has to show that the decision makers had knowledge of a protected activity. And McFarland cited Brungart v. Bell South, uh, which has, I think, a really good explanation for why this is important. In that case, um, at 231 Federal 3rd 800, Brungart v. Bell South says, implying knowledge from temporal proximity, despite the decision makers unrefuted testimony that he did not know would improperly allow a fact finder to decide, I'm sorry, I should say I'm paraphrasing, not quoting. Let's make that very clear. Mm -hmm. But this is what he said, would, Im would improperly allow the fact finder to decide without any basis other than temporal proximity that the decision maker is lying. And that, that Now, Ms. Murphy not. here argues there are other factors besides, or in addition to, uh, the temporal proximity that, um, would support an inference of knowledge. Um, I don't want to take the time to go back over my notes of our previous argument, but I think you, the present, then you've heard her, heard the point she made. Um, there, there was, uh, uh, let's see, for example, um, well, I, I don't want to try to read my notes, which are been, frankly impenetrable. Um, but why don't you, I mean, do, how do you feel about, how, do you want to respond to the other factors? that Ms. Murphy has identified here. I'm happy that, to, uh, I'm happy to. And, and I, do, I do have those in my notes. Um, first, let's talk about the ones in the brief that I think were not addressed as much in argument, but I think are important. Um, Kalaski argues that Dr. Mitchell wanted to be notified about important matters involving the agency. And so from that, he infers that Hildum would have told Mitchell, and you can make an inference that Hildum told Mitchell. But it is just as likely that Hildum did not think this applied to the MPD database, because that was a concern, if it was a concern, the alleged concern was 
two years, three years old at that point and involved a different agency and the agency was busy dealing with its own immediate crisis. And the best evidence that it's just as likely that Hildum would not have told Mitchell is that Kalowski didn't tell Mitchell. Every argument that Hildum would have told Mitchell applies equally to Kalowski. He too was a senior manager. He too was working with Mitchell daily and having one-on-one -on -one meetings on a regular basis. If he believed that that uh, directive applied to this knowledge, then he would have told Mitchell himself. And the Superior Court also pointed out that it's just as likely that Hildum assumed that Kalowski had already told Mitchell. And so he wouldn't have had a reason to, to, to tell him in that immediate circumstance. Uh, you know what I think Ms. Ms. Murphy was pointing to most earlier as an indication of knowledge was a sort of a pretext argument that there's problems with the chronology here. Um, Dr. Mitchell had the numbers before um, uh, Mr. Mitchell gave him any information. And um, they, they, although she didn't frame it in precisely this way, I think she was sort of arguing that, look, you can, there's so many flaws in Dr. Mitchell's claim that he fired Dr. Kalowski because of this misinformation. Um, that, it, it, that, that, the, that the skepticism one should have about that explanation for firing is indicative of knowledge on, uh, and the true reason, as it were, on Dr. Mitchell's part. Um, I'm not stating Ms. Um, uh, Murphy's argument as well as she could or did, but I think that's sort of the gist of it. How do you want to respond to that? Well, I have two responses to that. Um, the first is that evidence that of, of some factual dispute regarding the reasons for termination is no substitute for evidence of employer knowledge. Uh, Mr. Kalowski has not pointed, or Dr. Kalowski has not pointed to a single shred of case law or any sort of authority suggesting that employer knowledge can somehow be inferred due to some disbelief of the reason for termination. But I also really want to address the merits of that claim. I think that's really important. And the first thing that I think this court has to consider is whether it should even consider this argument about there being some confusion regarding the dates as to when Dr. Kalaski gave Dr. Mitchell the information, because this was not raised in the Superior Court. This could have been brief in the Superior Court, but it was not. It does not appear in the statement of material disputed facts. This is required by Superior Court Rule 12 IK. And if you look at, at, at Joint Appendix 266 to 67, there is no mention of any dispute over whether Dr. Kalowski gave Dr. Mitchell that information before the council hearing. In fact, the only way you can parse out what Dr. Kalowski is referring to as a factual conflict, and I will not concede that it even is one, but the only way you could even see that in the evidence is by looking on a calendar and taking judicial notice of when that council meeting occurred. The council meeting was something that, that that they asked this court to take judicial notice of, but that did not appear in the Superior Court. And I would argue that this is precisely the type of argument that has to be made in the Superior Court because it could easily have been resolved. And to suggest now that there's a dispute of fact over something that was not raised as a disputed fact and was not, it doesn't show up anywhere in the arguments in the brief, that in itself is a reason not to consider it. But I will also note that even if this court were to consider this argument, it is undisputed that Dr. Mitchell blamed Dr. Kalowski for giving him those wrong numbers, that he thought those numbers came from Dr. Kalowski, and he had good reason to. The evidence shows that on uh, the day of the council hearing, he asked a manager in an email, another manager, to work with Kalowski to get the information to him. That is at JA 306. It is undisputed that Dr. Mitchell was given the wrong number before the council hearing. In my brief, I've asked the court to take judicial notice of the council recording, and he, Dr. Mitchell definitely gave that number, 77 
uh, sexual assault kits at the hearing when he was asked by the council. And then later that evening, in a series of emails, uh, Dr. Mitchell re was referring and, and his supervisors, there was a chain where they kept referring to the 77 urgent sexual assault cases. That's at pages pages 310 and 311. Ms. Not Johnson, are you is your argument, I just missed the intro to this, is it that you um, you're saying even if, um, yes, but it sounds like you're saying it can't be, um, or, or is it just that Dr. Mitchell reasonably, whether, um, Dr. Kalowski was involved in the handing over of the information on May 4th, uh, Dr. Mitchell reasonably thought that, um, or that we know he was involved in the handing over of it maybe later. Um, it was wrong. He corrected it in a way or, or failed to correct it or failed to give an explanation in a way that may have been a reasonable basis for termination of an at will employee. Is that, is that what you're saying? Or it sounded like you were saying even if but not even if. So, so I'm saying all of the above and let me restructure it for you. I, this, this is the first time I've done a virtual argument and I know that we have to make some adjustments for that. Um, so the, I think the, you're thinking on this is definitely more organized than mine. So. <laughs> I'll do my best. I'll do my best to organize it. So my top line argument is that this is forfeited. Right? This was a factual dispute that had to be raised in the Superior Court. My next line argument is that that's the one you came up on, that even if there is, a, the court were to consider whether there's a factual dispute, the, the facts that look like they're in dispute are immaterial because what matters is what Mitchell thought. And Mitchell asked for that information to come from Kalowski. The information came to Mitchell from someone and we don't know who, we don't know that it wasn't Kalowski. Nothing in Kalowski's depositions or uh, declaration suggests that he didn't give the information twice, right? But even if someone gave Mitchell that information, Mitchell told the council that information. And then a few days later, it was Kalowski who sent the email saying the information was wrong. Kalowski didn't say in that email, the other person gave you wrong information. And then I also gave you wrong information. He just said, hey, that number, that number is wrong. So the evidence would be a lot cleaner if this had been raised in the Superior Court. This is why you do that. But even based on this evidence, Dr. Mitchell had no reason to doubt that Kalowski was to blame. He had no reason to doubt that. He asked for the information from Kalowski, and Kalowski's the one who ultimately told him the number was wrong. So given the undisputed evidence that Dr. Mitchell believed the information came from Kalowski, that in itself is an independent ground for uh, affirmance. But I will also note, and I think this is important, that the reason for the termination isn't relevant because Dr. Mitchell didn't know about the protected disclosure. The reason for the termination is literally an alternative argument if this court were to find that there was employer knowledge. Isn't, oh, isn't there argument, I mean, isn't there, um, didn't Dr. Klauski himself provide evidence that he gave the bad information after the the council's meeting that's correct he gave the information we know for sure once he gave the wrong information he may well well also have given the information on the day of the council hearing but certainly mitchell thought it came from kalowski both times but isn't it um, it seems like if if <laughs> Dr. Klauski were correct that he absolutely was not involved in the pre-meeting handing of, of bad information that that might undermine the inference that um, Dr. Mitchell, re that it was reasonable for him to think it was from him. Like, I, I don't know if it really wasn't from him, maybe that would undermine it. I don't, I don't think so. I, I think, first of all, Dr. Mitchell, uh, I think obviously he was upset that he gave the wrong information to the council. But what he fired Dr. Kalowski for was because he lost confidence in his competence. And Dr. Kalowski admits that he gave the wrong number. And I, Dr. Kalowski has made some arguments that this is de minimis, but this information was very important to the agency. This is a flagship statistic for DFS, the number of rape kits that it has in its backlog. And anyone who'd been running the DNA lab for three years should have known this answer off the top of his head. So I also don't think it matters when 
Dr. Kalaski gave the wrong information. Even if he didn't give it the first time, he definitely concedes that he gave the wrong information to Dr. Mitchell, and he concedes that he's the person who told Dr. Mitchell that he gave the wrong information, and that he didn't give any explanation as to why the information was wrong the first time. Now, this now is I do seem to recall somewhere he does give an explanation, right? I don't remember when he when that first is provided. Do you remember that off the top of your head? Uh, no, my understanding is there may be some um, reasoning as to why he didn't have the right, in, well, he just said he relied on different people and that it was someone else's fault. But that's in argument in litigation. That's oh, not in that, the record. In the record, he, and perhaps to his credit, um, did not try to place the blame on anyone else. But, and, and also if you look at the context, I mean, First of all, of course, this court shouldn't be looking at whether this is too harsh of a penalty. But also, if you look at the context, the agency had just chopped off all of its top leadership. And Dr. Kalowski was like, they chopped off the head and Dr. Kalowski was next up. And if he looked like he also was incompetent, I mean, they were in a firing mood. It was time to get rid of people and clean up the agency as quickly as possible. There was no time to lose. So what might have seemed like a startling, although I don't think it would be, but what could maybe seem like a harsh penalty would not have been a harsh penalty under that climate. Okay. Um, you're also over your time. We gave Ms. Murphy a little extra time and we um, I guess giving you a little extra time. Do you want to wrap up? I don't want to just cut you off at the. Uh, um, I do. I do. Um, I. I'm looking to see if there's anything else I need to add. I actually don't think so. Uh, the record is simple. Uh, not much discovery was conducted. There were 14 months of open discovery, and not a single fact deposition was taken by the plaintiff. And perhaps there would be more information about what happened if that had been done. But the plaintiff has never never suggested to the superior court there was good cause to extend discovery or give them give give Kalaski more time and actually hasn't suggested that there's good cause here before this court has never suggested that there was a reason for not taking that discovery so the record is what it is and it's insufficient council thank you we'll hear uh, back from miss murphy miss murphy we'll give you a few minutes Thank you, and I will certainly be brief. Um, to start at the end and work backwards um, in addressing the discovery issue, I would just like to simply also raise that we do believe it was abuse of discretion to not allow the out of time deposition that was duly noticed. Uh, there, is, there is a notice of deposition that was submitted very early on in the litigation to the district. And throughout the litigation, the agreement of the parties on each and every extension of the, lid, of the discovery periods was for three specific items, to, for each side to take depositions and additional time for the district to respond to the propounded discovery. May I ask you a question about that? I wanna be sure my understanding here is correct. Um, roughly, I, I think it was in April of 2017, if I remember correctly, the district raised objections to the Rule 30b-6 notice, of the, or to the notice of a Rule 30b-6 deposition that Dr. Kalowski served. Um, and I think it made it clear that we're not, we're not going along with that because of these objections. And my understanding is that Dr. Kalowski never um, either moved to compel the district to comply with the notice or never provided a substitute notice that dealt with the objections. And then for that matter, as the district has said in its brief, never um, made, never filed an affidavit and made a Rule 56D uh, argument to the judge that this discovery, that is premature to grant summary judgment without this discovery. Am I right about those things? Um, you're, you're correct, Your Honor, that there were objections raised to the scope, but there was never anything filed to narrow that scope. Um, and excuse me, there was the, never. I beg, I beg your pardon. There was, there, never, was, there was never any action taken on the part of the district to seek to narrow that scope. They, they, in some letters, lodged some objections, um, but they, but they. Well, what always, more do they have to do? I, they've objected. I mean, right, my, the, but you know, they it's also. Been a long time since I was involved in litigation, so don't look to me for. But they also consistently on, but um, each and every. I would have thought it's the plaintiff. 
each and every extension, there was still an agreement to allow that deposition to go forward. So they never said we're not, it wasn't until the trial court's erroneous decision to disallow no, but one rather a, but than the other. there's a problem here, I think, for you that I, it seems to me, Mr. I don't want to, I don't want to frame, I mean, the plaintiff, as well as the district, allowed the discovery period, the final deadline to pass. And Dr. Kalowski never, even then, you know, he, he, he never sought to take the, 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 the 30 B6 discovery prior to that deadline. And even after it, when the district moved for an extension for its purposes, he didn't move for any sort of extension for that discovery. Well, he I, agreed. I, 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 it seems to me that, that, that he's got a problem here. He sort of waived the, by, by failing to take the steps that you normally take when the other side is not going along with your discovery request. Hasn't he, he sort of waived the issue? Wholly apart from the Rule 56D. I, I would say he has not, Your Honor, because, because the, every step along the way, the agreement of the parties was for the same agreement, the same scope. So there was no reason to believe that that wasn't going to occur until the court precluded the, precluded the deposition to go forward because efforts were made even at that point to seek the scheduling of the deposition, but for other reasons and for the interpretation of the erroneous order, the district refused to produce anyone. Um, and, and I don't mean to skip around, but I, to circle back to a couple items I wanted to just mention. Um, in exhibit four uh, attached to Dr. Kalowski's um, summary judgment opposition, there is there there were submitted there's submitted record evidence of emails that clearly indicate that discussed the 77 DNA test before Dr. Kalowski was requested to get involved with producing more information. And that coupled with the fact that no one ever indicated that any of these requests for information were for the district, the DC council hearing. Um, is, is circumstantial evidence that does undermine the proffered reason. Um, and all of this is circumstantial evidence tied with the temporal proximity that, that demonstrates uh, that there is knowledge. And again, the Bernanke case does say that close temporal proximity, in that case, it was a month, and here it's three quarters less time, that, that does give rise to, to retaliatory intent, an inference of retaliatory intent, and that does give rise to an inference of knowledge. And the only way to that that doesn't meet summary judgment is if the trial court is rejecting some information and accepting others. And that's impermissible weighing of the evidence and resolving credibility issues that's just not permitted. So therefore, we would ask- What evidence do you think the trial judge when you say rejecting some information or some evidence, what evidence do you think the trial judge here in, rejected? In the, in the summary judgment order, the trial judge specifically resolves issues about the validity of the policy. It says that that doesn't matter and that doesn't count. The trial judge specifically speaks to the circumstances surrounding the temporal proximity and isolates temporal proximity to a place to say, if it's just te temporal proximity, it's not enough. Whereas the circumstance, there is more than just temporal proximity here. There's temporal proximity very close in time happening amongst a lot of other contexts. And to disregard the context within which this is happening is to weigh the evidence improperly and to, to reject the inferences that are favorable to Dr. Kalowski that he's entitled to at the, at the summary judgment stage. So for, the, for all these reasons, we would ask your honors to reverse the, the summary judgment, remand for trial, and we would further ask this court to, to allow the 30B6 uh, deposition to go forward. Council, thank you both. Case is now uh, submitted. Thank you, your honors. And, you, and um, I probably don't need to say this, but you may log off. <laughs> you have a good afternoon. <laughs> Ah, uh, good. 
We are ready to call the second case on today's calendar. Marion Larman versus United States, number 18, CF 642. Um, Council, Mr. Hart. Yes, Your Honor. You may proceed. Uh, if I remembered to change my name, I would have, but I wish the court to know that I'm here on behalf of the appellant, Marion Larman. Uh, perhaps while I sit quietly listening to the government, I can do that. Um, I'd like to make uh, two points, uh, be very brief, uh, because although the two points are important, uh, I'm also afraid my wife will start the vacuum cleaner and I'll be talking to a blank screen. This is a, a search of two purses taken from a car stop for a traffic violation, well, actually for driving without a license a violation. The, uh, the Superior Court uh, uh, permitted the search and did not suppress the drugs taken from the purse in the front seat, which we'll call the black purse, uh, because it felt that uh, the search was warranted under uh, community, um, what did he call it? The community caretaking function. Um, thank you, uh, the community caretaking function. Now that wasn't the, uh, that wasn't the uh, theory proposed by the government, but the court's allowed to do that. And um, you'll note in the government's response, they address that second. The first uh, issue that they bring up really is their contention that uh, the search was allowed because he was of a purse immediately associated with the person of the appellant. And now I get to the two points that I'd like to make. The first one is the government bases this argument on a statement that the appellant claimed the black purse in the front was hers. If you look at the video of the body cam, which the government submitted as a as supplemental, you'll notice at the mark, which the government notes in its brief for the claim of the white purse is mine, is really very ambiguous. The words that I heard were, the policeman says, is the purse in the front seat yours? And the appellant responds, yeah, but I want everything to stay in the car. Now, you could argue that, yes, that's a claim of, of ownership of the, of the black purse. But if you listen another 20 or 30 seconds later in the body cam video, you'll hear the appellant make quite explicit the ownership of the black purse is her sister. She owns only the white purse in the back seat. She says the black purse is hers, and she still wants the, the police not to take the purse. When she claims that... Uh, when, she, when the police explained to her that it well, if we take your purse, the white purse in the back, we have to take all the personal property, including the black purse, into custody down to the police station. I think one of the officers, is this not correct? One of the officers stated something to the effect that he wasn't really sure whether this was or was not her purse. Yes, that is correct, Your Honor. So he, he was taking it. And I don't know, initially when I read the government's brief, I thought, like you, that the government was relying on the premise that um, the purse actually was um, uh, uh, Miss Larman's. But later in the brief, the government, I think, makes it a little clearer that they're not really relying on that proposition. Uh, oddly enough, um, the government's in a better position uh, under the Fourth Amendment, it would seem, if... Um, to the extent there are facts indicating the purse was not Miss Larman's. But um, let me ask you a question. The government's first argument, as you noted, was that this was a search incident to an arrest because the purse was closely associated with Miss Larman. Now, um, you don't, you, you have not replied to that argument. There's nothing in your brief address. That, that argument. What are we to make of that? Well, what's wrong with that argument, wholly apart from the um, question of whether the community caretaking exception applies? The, the appellant was not associated with the purse, the black purse, in the way in which the government cases they cited in their brief rely upon. 
for instance, I believe it was the two cases from the state of Washington, which allowed such a search because in, in the first case, you see the name is Bird, I believe. In the Bird case, the woman had the purse on her lap when she was arrested in her car. And the search was permitted because the purse was closely associated with her person. Can I ask you, Mr. Hart, before you refer to the second one to compare the facts of this case, is it true that uh, with respect to the black purse, it was, if you were going to use this phrase, at least arguably associated with her in the sense that that was the purse that she reached into and from which she removed uh, documentation about um, uh, license and registration. And it also was the purse as to which, although she denied ownership of the purse, she did uh, uh, assert to the officers that she that there were items inside the purse that were hers, including the money and a wallet. Yeah. And, I, I agree. It, it, and if the issue is intimate or, or immediate association, whatever you think that might mean, those seem like at least arguable immediate associations. Arguably they are, but they're not the whole story. I believe there is also evidence in the record that the wallet from which she took her driver's license and whatever the police asked for in the traffic stop, the wallet was on top of the purse, black purse, not in the purse. It's true there was some testimony that she reached into it by one of the police officers, but there is conflicting testimony. Certainly it's not unusual to have something on the passenger seat of your car and your wallet on top of that. And that doesn't mean you own what's supporting the wallet on the front seat. So that can be argued, but it's a very tenuous argument in light of the fact that she outlined to the police the very things your, your honor said, that the purse was her sister's and that the wallet and the money were hers. And Can I you, ask you another question? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Jeff. I, I just one follow up question, which is just and, and in assessing this idea of immediate association, do you think the officers were required to uh, uh, take your client's word uh, as true, or were they uh, permitted to have uh, to, to be considering the possibility that she might not be accurately describing her connection to those objects? I think they were required to take Ms. Larman's statement as true, unless they have something that's conflicting with that statement. They see a name or initials on the purse that's not hers, or her, it, or, I'm sorry, if they see that a name or, uh, or initials on the Oh, they did have something. If that's going to be your distinction, they did have something. To, <laughs> they had quite a lot. She took her wallet out of the purse and her driver's license out of the purse. So they certainly did have some inconsistent uh, evidence there, raising a question about whether she was telling the truth when she said the purse was not hers. She, she let me ask you another. It. Let me ask you. Well, I know she explained it. Let me ask you another question. Um, the, the, the government has the burden in a case like this to establish um, the exception to the warrant arm that applies. At the trial and at the hearing, the government never relied on the community caretaking um, uh, exception. Is that correct? That's correct. So why do you concede that it was all right for the judge to come up with that exception and uh, as to which he'd heard no argument and um, apply it after rejecting the exceptions that the government had proffered. I don't think I have a good answer to that, Your Honor. I, I, I just assume that the motions court had that power if the theory held and it would be uh, supported by, by the appellate court. I don't think he's, I don't think he's limited to what the government proposes as the basis for the search. I, I mean, well, okay, if that's your position. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm, I'm really I mean, it's bothersome to me because it could come as a bit of a surprise to the defense in such a situation that after they thought they were defending against a claim of search incident to an arrest, for example, which the judge then rejects and, you know, they say, woohoo, we've made it through. And then the judge comes up with something that nobody's ever argued. And the judge and the defense hasn't even had the opportunity to, you know, prepare for it and present evidence and so forth to support it. 
Um, I, I, I just wonder about the appropriateness of that. And I wonder whether we should be considering that on appeal, although you've not objected to it. I would, I would ask the court to consider that, and, but I agree the trial counsel did not raise an objection to that or ask for a reconsideration. But I'm willing to take any basis on which this court finds the, the superior court. Sure right. if we're, Mr. Hart, if we're shifting over to the community caretaking side of the case, um, Am I right that, again, focusing on what arguments you are or not contesting, that you're not contesting the first of the four Hawkins factors and that your uh, arguments have been focused on the second, third, and fourth uh, parts of the uh, Hawkins test? That's correct. Your Honor. And um, to shift to that, I, well, I, I'm curious about this because I struggle with this. Do you do you have a stab at what the difference is between the second and the fourth of the Hawkins uh, factors? Because I find them a, a little hard to keep separate. Well, I, I think they might address potentially different situations. Um, in, with, in regards to both two, three, and four, our critical argument is that the appellant told the police wanted the, the material left in the car in the lot parked legally parked car, and I don't think the I don't think the police have an argument that it was their duty to remove it because they were afraid it might be stolen and they'd be liable. She waves that line. Well, uh, that does wrap around, Mr. Hart, to the question of what their beliefs might have been about whose property it was. They had information, both from her statements and from the computer searches, that the car was not hers. Yeah. Uh, now, she indicated that she had a, you know, a relationship with the person whose car it was, which, again, they may or may not have uh, 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 credited. Um, but with respect to the purses, uh, I mean, she's denying that one of them is hers. Uh, and there may or may not be reason for them to be uncertain about whether what she's saying is accurate. So uh, do you think that they could reasonably have had concerns that she wasn't really in a position to waive uh, uh, the property interests of people who had, uh, you know, some of those valuables? I mean, by her own account, the, I don't know about other, what else was in her sister's purse, but a purse is where you keep valuables and it wasn't hers. So you think she also could waive her sister's interest in the, the protection of the property? Yes, I do. She explained it was her sister's, not a stranger's, that her sister was staying with her. And that uh, the if you're going to accept the close proximity, you have to also accept that she has some responsibility for that purse in, in the car by herself and that she can waive that. And it's really not... It's really a question of police liability. No one would ever sue the police for stealing something they asked to be kept in the car. And I don't understand why the police use that as a cover to make a general inventory search on the scene. Well, suppose the purse had been stolen and um, the, the, the police and, and, and um, Ms. Lamy says, look, just leave it in the car. And um, the police acquiesce in that request and then it gets stolen. You think the person who's the true owner of the purse and has just lost some valuable property in it um, would not have a, uh, any sort of grievance against the police there, especially waving the, I think, waving the general order and saying, what were you thinking? Your general order tells you to um, take, take charge of that property. Well, had the police explained that to Ms. Larman at the scene, she could have told them how to resolve that problem. They did not explain that to her. That was not an option. It apparently did not enter the police's mind at that time. Did she, time. Suggest, did she suggest to the officers that they should put it first in the trunk or put it in the glove compartment and lock the glove compartment? She did not. I'm not certain it would fit in the glove compartment. And I don't believe that vehicle has a trunk. 
although it could have been put underneath the seats or underneath the mat, as people usually do to hide. Value. Oh, is that is that true that the is that true that the, the vehicle does not have a trunk? Well, it, it's a Kia. I I forget the model, but from looking at the, the body cam, it does not appear to have a conventional trunk. I see. And uh, leaving us, I mean, I know one of your uh, lines of reasoning is given that she was willing to have the objects left in the car, it just wasn't reasonable under the Fourth Amendment for the police out of their own concerns to see instead seize the objects and take them back to the station. So I get that line of thought. Uh, but some of the questions just now have been, well, and, and even if they... Um, weren't going to just leave the objects on, leave aside waiver, they had another reasonable option. They could have secured the items better in the car somehow. They could have, you know, uh, maybe put them in a trunk if there is one or put them in the glove box if it would have fit and could be locked. Um, uh, the, which, are you arguing all of those options? Do you think there's one of them that you think the record would support? What's, which, which of those options, if any, do you think the pro police acted unreasonably by not kind of thinking of themselves and implementing? Well, the, um, we're, we're dealing with, with policemen who are aware of what's going on. They don't present her with those options. Many cars have, have compartments that are locked, that are in the back, even if they don't have a trunk. Uh, most cars have, have seats with a large area that could be slid things underneath. They did not present those options. They gave her, they gave her a, a binary option. And in fact, she chose the one- to Well, that, I thought they gave her no option. I yeah, mean, she, she, she floated one idea, just leave them here and my friends of mine could pick them up or at least leave one of them here. Um, and the officer said, no, we're not doing that. And really nobody at the, uh, as far as the trial, uh, the trial court evidence indicates, nobody expressly discussed or considered intermediate approaches, like instead of leaving them out where they were in view, trying to secure them in the car in some uh, less obvious way. That just doesn't, you're right. The officers didn't raise it. It's also true as far as we can tell that your client didn't raise it. It's just nobody was really considering at least as far as the evidence goes and people saying what they explicitly said or thought, nobody was really con considering all those options. I, I would agree with that characterization. And I think the and, lack and, of- And if the, well, if the issue I, is- Oh, go ahead, sorry. Can I just jump in? I mean, certainly they considered the option for the handicap placard. The police took it on themselves to put that in the glove box. Yes. So certainly other options for other items were on, was on their mind. Yes, but they, I agree with they you. wanted to take the purses in. Yes, they did. By the way, do you agree? Oh, or well, let me rephrase that. Do you, if we assume that the seizure of the purses, bringing them into down to the police station, was permissible under the Fourth Amendment, do you raise any separate objection to the search of those purses? Although trial counsel did not, I would. It, it's similar to the it's similar to the cell phone search where police can take the cell phone, but not its contents until they get a warrant. Um, the person. Well, can searching. I ask you just to, to make to clarify about tenses of things? Uh, you're indicating that you do think there might be some objections. Is that something that you briefed or is that a, a, a line of argument you're developing uh, here today? On the spot. Okay, so it, it just focusing on your brief for a minute. I don't mean to, to, to prevent you from spinning out the, the point you were getting to, but I just want to make sure I understand. In your brief, that's not a point you raised, uh, but you do think it's, there are arguments one could make about the legality of that search even if you assume the seizure and taking to the station was okay. Right. And you were, right, and, you, and, and as your theory on that is that once they have them back at the station, they need a warrant. I, I thought that the, the, to the extent there was discussion of this in the trial court, it focused instead on the inventory search doctrine and then there are possible questions about whether that doctrine was correctly or incorrectly applied. Um, so I, it might be that you'd have to, an, an analysis of that would have to get you into more than 
kind of uh, uh, the search incident to arrest issues that were in the cell phone case and, and warrants and the like, and more, or at least additionally, about the inventory search doctrine? Well, yes, it's probably an issue that will require much more time than I have. Well, but you see, I think, I think it's important to distinguish here. The search is, if, 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 the, if, the, if the search and seizure are, are claimed to be upheld, not under the search incident to arrest doctrine, but as, as a concomitant of the community caretaking exception. I, it's hard for me to understand how the community caretaking exception justifies looking into the persons once they've taken care of them, <laughs> as it were, by protecting them from, from theft. And, and I just wonder whether there's something there that needs to be uh, uh, examined. I agree. If they were arresting Miss Miss, if they knew that they were that they were arresting Miss Armin, especially if they knew that at the time they did the search that they were that she was going to go to jail, then they have the right to um, uh, look in, into the purses in connection with the the. the um, and inventory their contents. Um, it's not so clear to me they have that right if she's simply down at the station for some paperwork and then they're going to let her go. But even if we posit that's true, I don't understand how the justification is not, if the justification that they're relying on is the community caretaking function or that the judge was relying on, that that supports the search of the purses. Then maybe you can say, well, it's a two-step process and they have different justification once they had it at the police station. Then we're in virgin territory because the judge never said anything about that. Yes, I agree, he but, did not. Um, well, let us hear from the government. He did not because Sorry. trial counsel didn't raise it and because you haven't either. That's correct, Your Honor. Well, let us hear from the government and we'll give you, I, I recall that you requested some uh, time in rebuttal and we'll give you a few minutes in rebuttal. Thank you. Mr. Covert. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Matthew Covert on behalf of the United States. May it please the court. Uh, the search and subsequent, uh, or I should say the seizure and then the subsequent search of Ms. Larman's purse that's at issue in this case was lawful under the Fourth Amendment for, for two reasons. First, um, as a search of her person incident to arrest under Robinson. And second, uh, as the trial court found under the community caretaking doctrine, uh, I'd like to step through those one at a time and, and starting with uh, Robinson and, and search incident to arrest. Uh, to pick up uh, where Judge McLeese was asking Mr. Hart about the other evidence that, that suggested that this purse was immediately associated with Ms. Larman. Beyond can, I, can I stop you right there with the immediately associated language? Um, doesn't that come from Rabinowitz? I, I believe that's, that's the initial discussion of it. And then I think in Chadwick, uh, we start to see that language uh, reappear. That's right. Okay. I, I mean, I thought it was sort of um, undermined in, in Schimmel. Uh, we, we disagree, Your Honor. And, and I think Chadwick um, makes that clear. Uh, where Chadwick distinguishes between two different types of searches incident to arrest, searches of persons, and, and searches of the grab area under Schimmel. And, and where it comes to a head in the case law is whether and to what extent officers can search uh, that type of property once the article has been reduced to the exclusive possession of the police. In the case of Schimmel area searches, uh, for example, a, a wastebasket sitting underneath uh, someone when they're arrested, once that arrestee no longer has access to that area, uh, Chadwick would, would, would preclude that kind of search. The difference though, and where Chadwick makes this clear, is that there's an exception. And the exception is for articles that are immediately associated with the person of an arrestee. Can, and can I ask you about what that phrase immediately associated means in your view? Because it's not a very well-defined concept. Uh, so let me just say that, um, let me give you a hypothetical. Imagine that uh, what had happened is rather than reaching into a black purse, uh, Ms. Larman had reached into the pocket of a jacket 
that was lying, you know, uh, kind of within reach towards the you know, back seat of the car. Would that have been an item that was immediately uh, associated with her? Just to clarify the hypothetical, when you say reach into the jacket, I assume you mean for her driver's license? Yes. Yeah. Incorrect, I, yes. Sure. I think in that situation, I think the analysis is the same. I don't. And for two and, reasons, okay. And and would it uh, do, would it matter if there had been no reaching, but she's the only person in the car, and it's winter, and she's not wearing a jacket, and a jacket's right, you know, sitting right there. Do you think a jacket? like a purse is, you know, if it's uh, with you in a car where it seems like inferentially it's what you've been wearing or going to be wearing, is that immediately associated with you? I think it is. I, I do agree that. Let me, tell you the, uh, let me just tell you the reason I'm asking that line of questioning, because I, I'm a little concerned that uh, the distinction you're drawing about two kinds of search incident to arrest uh, is undermined uh, more by Gantt, uh, because in Gantt, uh, one of the two objects that was searched in Gantt was a jacket that was lying in the, you know, uh, kind of by the, you know, near the driver in the back of the car. And the court ended up concluding that, uh, you know, that was not a legitimate search. I think they found some drugs in there. Uh, and if there is this uh, distinction that survives Gantt uh, that uh, permits some, you know, not very clearly defined searches of things that aren't really on somebody's person, but are pretty close. So they're not on you, they're not in your grab area, but they're kind of in your penumbra. Um, it seems like Gantt didn't recognize that, didn't apply it properly, and uh, leads me to wonder whether that's really what's going on here after Gantt. Sure, I, I think that's a fair question, Your Honor, and I, I guess there, there are two points that I'd like to make. Um, the first is, and I think this is clear both from the Gantt opinion itself and, and State versus Byrd, which is the Washington Supreme Court case that we cite in our brief that that heavily discusses uh, the distinction between Robinson and Chimmel in, in a post Gantt context. Uh, we think it's very clear that there was no attempt by the Supreme Court to modify the Robinson doctrine. Gantt doesn't cite Robinson in any meaningful way. There is no discussion from the in Chief Justice Roberts' opinion in in, in that case about no, uh, but Gantt Gant goes. This goes back to my question about Rabinowitz, which is then kind of undermined in Chimmel. Gantt returns to Schimmel and says, under Schimmel, the police may search incident to arrest only the space within an arrestee's immediate control, meaning the area from within which he may gain possession of a weapon or destructible evidence, right? They're, they're talking about Schimmel and they're saying, this, this is the universe here, right? And, and if you've got him out of the car, then, then you don't get everything else in the car even if it's immediately associated. I mean, I, you know, as Judge McLeese says, it's curious that they didn't start talking about other items that are immediately associated with, with the defendant's person in that discussion. It, it would strongly suggest that that is not a basis for, for doing a seizure. So, so Judge Easterly, I think, again, and, and I, I might reiterate my point a little bit here, I do think we have to put the Gantt opinion in context. And as I, I said- I know, and you wanna do it with a Washington state court opinion and, and I'm looking at the Supreme Court case law. So I, I think that would be more helpful to, to look at that. Sure, and my response is that um, as I read Gantt, Gantt is silent on the question of to whether and what extent it's holding modifies an officer's ability to seize and search items incident to arrest that are- I, I guess I, I have a hard time agreeing with that. And so let me ask you about what you think of this language from Gantt that seems to me not silent on those topics. And it's in the part where it's like Roman numeral two, I have a, you know, a Supreme Court version, you know, so the pagination might be off, but it's Roman numeral two at the beginning. And the court is explaining what the rationale for the search incident to arrest exception is. Not some subpower of it like Schimmel or something, but it's the overall rationale for the doctrine. And the court says it derives from interest in officer safety and evidence preservation. Um, and then it goes on and talks about uh, uh, Schimmel or however you say it. Uh, and then there's this quote where it says, if there is no possibility that an arrestee could reach into the area that law enforcement officers seek to search, both justifications for the search incident to arrest exception are absent. Not the, you know, Chimel piece of it, as opposed to the uh, uh, Robinson piece of it. 
And then the rest of the sentence and the rule does not apply. Not and you know one narrow piece of the exception or expressing no view of the other. Uh, and so I, I, I'm a little uh, doubtful that Gantt is silent and it's a long question, but just the other piece of it is, can you explain if you think that this doctrine survives, can you root it in the rationale that the court identified in uh, uh, Gantt, which is why would officer safety and evidence preservation justify the exception that you're saying still exists in the circumstances of this case? Sure, sure, Your Honor. I'll, I'll try to address that as briefly as I can. Um, we agree that, that Schimmel's twin rationales, officer safety and evidence preservation, as a general matter, govern the search incident to arrest doctrine. And specifically, I think the, the, the core of Robinson's holding and the progeny of Robinson is that when you're talking about searches of, of articles, uh, uh, either of persons or articles immediately associated with them, as an automatic matter, those types of searches uh, sort of per se introduce ideas of officer safety and evidence preservation. And, and so to, to finish the point, I think this comes down then to a question of timing. I don't think there's really a, a great argument on the other side that at the very moment uh, the officers ordered Miss Larman out of the car, in, in essence, once they develop probable cause to arrest, she is under arrest at that point. But that person- but I'm really trying to understand the timing there. Uh... They saw her engage in a traffic violation. Now, is it right that she's sitting in the car while they are generating the other information and they don't order her out until they've learned about the suspended license? Is that right? That's I just can't remember the sequence of events. All right. and, where, and where was she physically when the officer seized the purses? She was standing at the rear of the car. Uh, I don't, I, we've talked about trunk versus hat. No, I, I thought that was not right. I thought that the, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I thought they had moved, they parked the car uh, before the, they go in and, sur and seize the purses? Is that not right? Do they, uh, they seize the purses before they park the car? So I, I may be, you're right, Your Honor. I may be confusing when they, have, that when they first looked at that person in the back seat. So I, th I think that's right. They had relocated the, the car to the side of the road. And then- so, so, where, so where was Ms. Larman physically at the time the police officer actually physically reached into the car and grabbed the purses? So uh, to, I'm not sure, Your Honor. Um, she either would have been in the squad car or or standing outside. Um, she's a, she's already handcuffed. That, that's that's for sure. That's correct. Yes, but she was if, handcuffed. If the police the if the police stop a car uh, for you know a traffic violation, they have cause to arrest the driver. They tell the driver, "All right, get out." Driver gets out. There's nobody else in the car. Driver locks the car door. The police take the driver over to the um, squad car, put the, put the driver in the squad car and say, come. Um, you're telling me that the police can now go back to the car, um, open the door, um, and uh, retrieve personal items of the driver under the search incident to arrest exception? I just want to make sure I caught the, the first part of your question. In your hypothetical, do the are the officers arresting her based on probable cause when they order uh, no the, the, the arrest is stuff. valid it's a problem the, uh, the arrest is valid it's a problem there's probable cause in this case it was a traffic violation whatever <laughs> yeah so I'm, our, I'm not our, sure the, i'm not sure the the uh, offense matters to my hypothetical but i just want to make sure she was under arrest and not just a yeah no she's under arrest she's in the squad car they're taking her down to process her and now you're telling me that as a search incident to an arrest they can go back to the locked car, open it, and get her. And not because not under Gantt, because the, the evidence in the car, they don't have probable cause to believe there's evidence in the car, and they don't have probable, they don't have reasonable articulable suspicion to believe there's evidence in the car relating to the offensive arrest. So those other exceptions don't apply. So, so Judge Glickman, the answer to that question we believe is yes. And, it's and, and, is he, and how about if you take Judge Glickman's uh, hypothetical further and say, imagine that rather than doing it while the arrestee is sitting in the cruiser, you know, 50 feet or away, uh, they take, um, you know, imagine they had taken Ms. Larman to the station and then somebody, you know, one of the officers a half hour later thought, oh my gosh, uh, you know, we have this power under Robinson, uh, uh, unmodified by Gantt to, uh, you know, without any further showing, uh, take into our possession 
uh, items that were immediately associated with our RSD. So let's go drive back to the scene, uh, you know, an hour, an hour and a half later, and we'll go in and uh, exercise that authority. You say, sure, or do you think there's some sort of a temporal limitation? And if there is, what Fourth Amendment interest would you tie the, the, that limitation to? So Judge McLeese, I don't think there's a, a I mean, I, I suppose if we're talking days, weeks, months, perhaps, but um, I, I don't think there's a temple, temporal limitation. And, and based on your question, my answer would still be yes, if I could just briefly explain. Um, the, the way that the, the, the cases that we cite in our brief look at this question is where is the, the, the purse or the bag, whatever's at issue, in relation to the arrestee during the detention period? And the arrest. I, I have that. I just, but the, but the, I, I get that line of analysis where I run up to problems is the last part of the question I asked you, which is why should you look at it that way with respect to the interests that any version of the search incident to arrest doctrine is meant to protect? What, well, so what's, if you think there is a piece of Robinson that survives Gantt, that is its own little doctrine about uh, immediately associated objects. What's the, what, what is the weighing of the interest that that doctrine uh, protects and how it adequately reflects people's privacy? You're not protecting officer safety. Certainly if you're going back an hour and a half later when no one, you know, the, the person's at the, safe, the station, you're not protecting the destruction of evidence uh, uh, in, in any distinctive way. I mean, there's always that abstract risk. Uh, so what and what are you doing? How does it fit into the search incident to arrest doctrine? Uh, uh, the, the, that doctrine's rationales and the balancing that it reflects between law enforcement interests and privacy interests. It's a good question, Your Honor. And, and my response is: so if we're in the context of a of a sort of a second location search, whether it's at a station or a different area, what have you. At that point, we think the officer justification for searching the bag isn't necessarily rooted in- to be clear, Just to be very clear, my question was about the seizure. Not so much of, you know, once you, if you could lawfully seize it, no, okay, then there are interesting questions about how long you can wait before you search it. And those, that's its own additional set of complications. But why should the officers be allowed under the search incident to arrest doctrine in any of its forms to seize uh, the purse once uh, Ms. Larman is you know, in cuffs near the cruiser, accompanied by officers, and the car is parked on the other side of the road somewhere. I don't know exactly how far away. Why, why, why should they be allowed to seize it? What, inter what law enforcement interest is being advanced there? I apologize, Your Honor. I did, use to, I did mean to use the word seizure instead of search. Um, so so in, in that situation, we think the justification for the seizure, we agree at that point, probably isn't rooted in Chimmel's rationales of officer safety and evidence preservation, what, it, what it's rooted in and sort of the balancing that you're talking about is the suspects or the arrestees at that point wholly diminished expectation of privacy on the theory that at the time of the arrest, that article was immediately associated with her person. And the officers would have had the lawful authority under the Fourth Amendment and under Robinson to search it at that point. So, so under, and, and, and just to make sure you're saying that there is an immediate association component that survives Gantt and you're saying at least in a car, the wingspan idea doesn't so much survive Gantt. So what is the, like, can you give me examples of things that you think would be uh, uh, like, I mean, it, it does immediately associated mean anything that is in my wingspan that I possess? Or does it require some more intimate or centrality uh, 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 in the connection? Or how are we supposed to give content to that doctrine if, if, if we agree with you that it exists? Um, so, so here's how I would answer that question. I, I agree, I know we circled on this earlier that courts have been a little fuzzy in sort of how they define that immediate association language. But, but what I see as I read the cases that, that we cite in our brief and, and, and many of the cases that those decisions rely on, what courts are looking at is a combination of factors. One is the nature of the item that's being seized, as we've talked about, purse, jacket, some other item. And then within that, what they're looking at is the physical relationship of that item to the arrestee during the detention period. And I'm completely confused by this analysis because it's the personal relationship of this item to me. It's something, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting now with the, with the uh, language is 
uh, immediately associated with me that makes it searchable or seizable in your view. But you've also just said that because I've been arrested, I have little or no privacy interest in that item, um, which just has me all mixed up um, with this with this new idea of the Fourth Amendment applying. I, I guess I'm curious: does this um, does this theory that you're propounding apply outside of cars? Yes, and, and we and we cite cases. So, so if I'm at home and you come and arrest me at home and, um, and then you take me to the station and then you realize, oh, there were all these things that, were, that are immediately associated with, with that arrestee that are inside her house that we'd really like to have. Like her iPhone was right there and her iPad and um, you know, um, a, whole, a whole box of documents that looked really interesting. So they were immediately associated with her. We'll, we'll go get those now too? Uh, no, Your Honor. We think in that situation, the, the, the well-developed body of case law highlighting that what we all know, that homes have sort of a maximum- Oh, I thought you said it did apply in the home. So, but now, no. now it doesn't apply in the home. No, I know. I, I don't, if I, and if I did represent that, I apologize. I, I, I don't think that that doctrine would- So this is, this, this theory um, is just for cars. No, I think this, I mean, and the cases we cite, it also works for, for street encounters. Um, and some of the cases we cite involve situations where courts find that a backpack or a purse, what have you, is immediately associated with someone in, in sort of- can I, can I ask you about your, your the cases you cite? Because would you agree that most, though not all, of the cases you cite antedate Gantt? Um, that is- Yes, I, th I think Gantt's 2009. So I think I think that's correct. There are a few. And, that... Yes, and uh, is it your is it your understanding or your, your belief that the post Gantt cases that address this idea of whether you can search items beyond Gantt under some surviving doctrine about immediate association and the like, is it your view that the that all those cases come out one way, or do you uh, are, are you aware of cases that? Uh, are on the contrary side from the case or two that you folk, you've you identified that are post gant and kind of expressly address the issue? So, so the cases that I've identified are, are the two that I cite in the brief. Um, well, uh, well, I'm just the ambiguity of the word identified. Those are the, also all the relevant cases you are aware of. Yes, that, that's correct. That's correct. Uh, uh, and, and just, and am I right that the upshot of your argument is that Gantt, the uh, half of the search that was held unlawful in Gantt on proper argumentation should be held lawful? Because the officers in Gantt were allowed to go look at the jack, seize it, and then you know look inside. So I wouldn't go as far as to say that, and I know this touches on something we were discussing earlier in terms of the jacket hypothetical. Uh, what, what I meant to conclude my answer by saying is, I think when you're talking about a jacket in the back seat of a car, the way that I read the cases, I think we would probably need to see additional evidence of association, whether it's that person reaching into the jacket in the sight of the officers or doing something else to demonstrate to the officers that jack that that jacket um, is immediately associated with them. So, so I do agree, I think, with sort of the bare bones hypothetical that jacket by itself in the back seat, no physical manipulation of that on the part of the suspect. Probably... Uh, and same thing with purse. Well, so no, if there's no. a purse with no other connection, you would also say, well, how do we know it's the person who's sitting right next to it? Only person in the car. There's a purse sitting there. I mean, there's an inference, but you never know. The same is true of a jacket. Or do you think that the, the inferences are so different that the analysis would be different for a jacket and a purse if otherwise it's person in car, only one jacket, only one purse? I, I think the inferences are, are very different. And I think that some of the cases we cite, the, the Barry case from the Seventh Circuit and then Hinkle from Alaska, which discusses that case, they talk about the nature of a purse in and of itself and how um, it's a repository for personal effects that people take with them everywhere. Do you think that that holds true in 2020? I'm I, sorry. I think so. You, 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 you froze. So, so you think that it's, we can accept um, this, this assumption that in 2020, every woman has a purse. No, it's not that every woman has a purse, but when there is a purse, um, and that person it's is definitely hers. It's not, it's not a purse. It's definitely the woman's purse. Uh, I, I don't need to make the, 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 the sex based distinction, your honor, uh, only to say that in that kind of situation, I think it, it can apply to a backpack. 
um, or other similar repository for personal effects. A lot of these cases are purse cases. Um, and, and look, it's the reality that women are more likely to be carrying them. I don't dispute that. And a lot of these cases have um, female defendants for that, for that very reason. I know I'm significantly over my time. Um, well, no, it's, I, I, but I'd like to extend it a little bit because interesting as this issue is, and we could go on at some length with it, we also have the um, question of the community caretaking exception, which is the exception that the trial judge actually relied upon to uphold this search, the trial judge having rejected search incident to arrest. Um, uh, and I wonder if you could begin your, we won't go on forever, but I wonder if you could begin your discussion of this by answering the question I raised earlier about why it was appropriate for the trial judge to come up with an exception to the warrant requirement that it was the government's burden to present and that the government did not present. Uh, so Judge Glickman, my response to that is when we're looking at the government's burden in the context of a suppression hearing, it's a factual burden. And I think the court's concern should be alleviated by the fact, and I don't think uh, Mr. Hart can test this, is that the factual issues and the factual findings and the credibility findings, all of those things that were necessary to find this search lawful under the community caretaking doctrine are either present or, or, or were made by the trial court in this case. That, I, that seems to me puzzling. I mean, we've asked Mr. We were, when Mr. Hart was up, we were asking a bunch of questions about uh, and he was making some comments about, uh, you know, uh, would the purses have fit in the glove box? And did the, was there a trunk? And if the issue is, is what the officers did here reasonable, uh, balancing privacy interests of Ms. Larman, property interests of Ms. Larman, and perhaps others, uh, 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 liability concerns of the officers and the like, well, certainly one of the reasonable, one of the relevant variables is what the reasonable alternatives were. And if people had known that this issue was being litigated uh, uh, and that, that was going to be the government's theory, perhaps, and the trial court's ultimate theory, perhaps, uh, I think there, you know, a, a good prosecutor would have been eliciting some testimony about some of that. And a good defense attorney might have been exploring it. And uh, we might have had, you know, we might know a lot more about some of those things than we do if everyone had understood from the get go that this was uh, a legal issue that was going to be decided at the end of the hearing. So I, I, I agree that the parties didn't sort of frame the legal issues and, and to a certain extent, the testimony through the lens of the community caretaking doctrine. The question though, I think, is whether there are sufficient facts in the record and whether the necessary findings were made uh, for, to, to allow- And I'm kind court. of curious, sorry, I'm, I'm curious about this idea that all the government has to do is carry some factual burden, but has no obligation to make legal arguments. Um, I, not to sound flip, but but really, uh, I, is that really your understanding that all the government has to do in prosecuting a case is is make the factual arguments, and then the trial judge can put the put the the skeleton on of of the legal argument and come up with that after the fact without telling the parties. Uh, cer certainly not, Your Honor, but I do, I do think there is a necessary distinction to be made between uh, a situation like we have here where the issues are litigated from a factual standpoint and the gov government makes through, through briefing. Well, in the tomorrow. framework, I mean, it's like, you know, imagine a civil action in which the plaintiff brings a torts claim and, you know, all these facts about a contract are brought out, but there's no claim in the complaint about a contractual, a breach of contract claim. And then at the end of the day, the judge says, well, I'm ruling for the plaintiff because there was a breach of contract here. All the facts were brought out. There's something very puzzling about the government's position here and about what the judge did. The defense was, was the defense in any way on, I, I take it the government filed an answer to the motion to suppress uh, that's correct. And then there was some subsequent email briefing with, with the court. That's right. And so there's there's a framework that's being set up here, right? The, the, the motion, the government's answer said, here's what we're relying on, right? We're relying on search incident to arrest or whatever else there. But they didn't say anything about community caretaking exception, which is a somewhat unusual and infrequently litigated exception uh, with its own complexities. And 
um, nobody in that courtroom is, if I understand correctly, is thinking about that exception when they're presenting evidence. And nobody argues it to the judge. Why? I, I, I'm a little perplexed as to why, I'm perplexed that defense counsel didn't object, but, but um, uh, which, which uh, may or may not be an answer uh, here. But I am, and, and that there was no rape, and that this wasn't raised on appeal either. But why, why do you think that's proper? So, I mean, I bet if the shoe were on the other foot and, and the defense at a, at a trial said, you know, we have insanity defense here. We didn't mention it, but that's true. But the evidence shows that this defendant is completely out of his mind. Judge, we want an acquittal based on the insanity defense. And I think the government might say, you know, some things are waived, right? I, I think certainly, Your Honor. Again, I do think there's a difference between the parties. There's a rule for the insanity. I understand that, but that's yeah. a technical matter. Um, well, in the context of hashing out, let's say, jury instructions in the context of the insanity defense, I, I think, again, that is a little bit materially different. The, the, the best analogy... It's different, I, but I'm not sure it's materially different. That's my, that's my point. Yeah, the procedures are different than all that. But the principle at stake strikes me as similar, isn't it? Well, how, how is it different from in principle? So, so the, the best analogy I can make is a situation when the, when the government is offering um, some, if we're at trial, let's say. And, and the government is offering some exhibit, some video, what, what have you, into evidence. And the theory is that what's well, admissible under this rule of evidence, and there's argument from both sides about whether that hearsay rule, that hearsay exception applies, what have you. And at, at some point in the argument, the trial court says, well, I disagree that it fits under this exception, but for a totally different reason, I find this document admissible because it fits under this hearsay exception, moving on. I think I think that that is a similar situation to what we right, have. And, and you would agree, I assume, that if a party was surprised by that and said, "Wait a minute, Your Honor, you're ruling on a on a, on a, a different ground than the proponent of the evidence suggested," and before you rule, I'd like to have an opportunity to a uh, you know talk to the witness, you know, lay a foundation or assess whether there is a foundation and make an argument to you about whether it's correct or not correct. You would agree that that would that's a legitimate kind of objection and a trial court who uh, didn't uh, take reasonable account of it would act in, uh, inappropriately. Uh, to the extent that that issue was formally preserved and then raised on appeal, I admittedly I'm not um, as well versed in that sort of in, in, in the area of, um, you know, preserving issues for appeal. I can't speak to specific cases, but it would strike me that yes, had this issue been more formally pressed either at the hearing or through some subsequent briefing by defense counsel, and, and raised here on appeal, perhaps he has a stronger argument that the court should, should simply not reach the merits here. Or, or well, I would have thought he would have an unassailable argument. He would have had an unassailable argument if he'd raised it in the trial court, and assuming he felt prejudiced by it. But I think if he had said, wait a minute, Your Honor, community caretaking is arriving, you know, stage left out of nowhere. I don't know what that doctrine is. I haven't looked into it. I'd like to know something about it legally so I can represent my client. Uh, nobody has elicited any facts that are, you know, well, at least I wasn't trying to elicit any facts about the doctrine. I'm not sure I'm fit to here today because I don't even know what the doctrine requires. Uh, so we can't, you can't decide that today, Your Honor. That's just fundamentally unfair. Uh, wouldn't that have been an unassailable objection? I mean, what would, how, could, how could the trial court have done anything other then give additional time and at least on an adequate proffer of some additional information that would be germane, reopen the hearing. So, so I don't, I don't disagree. I think that had the issue been pressed in the way that, that Judge McLeese, you just laid out, that, that he would have had a much better, in, in your words, perhaps even unassailable preservation argument. But the fact that that didn't happen here. Well, no, it's not a preservation argument. That would have been an argument of procedural unfairness. Uh, nobody would have been saying anything about preservation. It would just be, I'm saying, Judge, it's fundamentally unfair for you to rule on this record at this time with no notice to me, so don't do it. Um, and uh, I gather you're, you're not quite willing to say it's unassailable, but you're willing to say it would have been potentially unassailable or perhaps unassailable. But I just don't see how there would have been any possible other response for a trial judge had the issue been raised. I, I think perhaps that that is, a, that is a fair contention, Your Honor. And I think that does dovetail with the fact that it wasn't raised on the um, appeal, which of course the court has um, noted. Uh, to the extent the court is willing to hear the, the, on, on the merits, I, I do want to spend just a, a few minutes um, because I do think it is 
important to the extent the question. I, have a qu I do have a question or two about that, so go ahead. Sure. Uh, so as we're looking at the Hawkins factors, I think, I think the court has sort of identified, and I don't hear much push, uh, pushback from Mr. Hart, that as an important backdrop to this, the, the officers here had no investigatory motive in terms of Hawkins' first factor. They had so no- this is this is yet another issue that has not been litigated, but is that in fact the case? I mean, on the videotape, in the squad car, the police officers are asking Ms. Larman, if she has any drugs on her. This is a traffic stop. So, so at that point, Your Honor, I think there's a critical distinction to be made in terms of timing. The seizure and then the search. And my, but my they've not looked in the bags, and yet they are investigating whether or not she possesses illegal drugs, which in fact she does in the purses that they have seized. Right, but but I think we so need to... isn't there an inference that in fact they are investigating, that they have some you know, they don't have probable cause, they don't have reasonable articulable suspicion, but maybe they've got a hunch. This lady has something on her that she does not want us to see. Does she have drugs? So, so, so can we say that this is totally investigated from a, a totally divorced from an investigation of crime? In, in, in terms of framing the issue very specifically, and this is how the trial court framed the issue, in looking at the lawfulness of the seizure, or not at the search yet, but of the seizure, there's no question that these officers- no, And I understand you're, you're doing, you're slicing the time very thin, but I'm just saying, look, they grabbed the bags and minutes later, they are asking her, do you have drugs on you? So, you know, it's, I think it's a fair inference to think they were thinking that question earlier and then they got her in the squad car and were asking her. And that's why they seized the bags. So, so perhaps that's one possible inference, Your Honor. The, the one point I would make just as a factual matter is that before the officers in the squad car ask Ms. Larman if, if there are drugs in the purse, it's only after Ms. Larman keeps asking questions about what they're gonna do with the purses at the station. So, so I agree, once they're in the squad car and Ms. Larman is asking them, what are you gonna do with the purses? It, it's, a fair, it's a fair inference, I would say, to think that, okay, Maybe she's got something in there, but, but, but here's where this distinction makes a critical difference. Once they've lawfully seized the purse, and I know there's some dispute about that, but assuming that the seizure was lawful, under Lafayette, they have the ability in their own regulations to inventory all of her prisoner's property at the station. That, is, that true under La is that true under Lafayette, even if they are not thinking in terms of putting her in jail? What they tell her is you'll be down there for a few hours and then you'll leave. They, so, they're not arresting her with the idea that we're sending you off to jail and you'll see you'll see the inside of a courtroom. Um, they, the, I mean, I, it, do you think Lafayette still sanctions a search of an inventory search of, of her purse under those circumstances? So to, to answer the question, I, I don't think it's Lafayette on its own, but, but what Lafayette makes clear is that so long as the police are following an established routine practice when they're conducting an inventory search. Well, I wonder whether the established routine practice that you're referring to, does it actually contemplate or envision this kind of a situation where the, the, the seizure of the person is not an arrest for the purpose of putting this person down at the jailhouse, but or incarcerating the person in some way, but simply a temporary stop at the police station to book you, then let you go for a traffic offense. Does it bother you at all? Well, let me ask you a preliminary question, if I may. In your opinion, how important is it to the government's invocation of the community caretaking function that? There was some question as to whether, as to who the owner of this purse was. Suppose there had been no, no question in the officer's mind that this purse belonged to this, um, this person. So we don't get into issues of, well, you know, it might have been somebody else's purse that she was having, and that, that affects our decision on the community caretaking function. I understand that. But suppose there had been no, no question at all. 
she said, leave, leave my purse in the car, lock the doors. I'll take the risk if it's going to, that it's going to be stolen. How important is this, in your view, to the government's argument here? So I think that it is a significant, but not necessarily a dispositive fact. I think it's significant for the reasons that I think were fleshed out in, in Mr. Hart's argument uh, and colloquy with the court, that there's this legitimate question that was raised. Yes, she, she is in possession. See, the, concern, of you see, the reason I asked the question is because the, the value of community caretaking, of protecting other people's property, well, that's a value, but it's not absolute. And when the other people whose property it is, you know, they don't have no interest in the property and they don't have no interest in the privacy of it. So if they say, look, I understand you want to protect my property, but I'm a competent adult and here's what I want. Here's what I want done with it. And what I want done with it is legal and it's perfectly OK. And you have no reason, legitimate reason to search it. And I don't want I don't want my arrest on a traffic stop to be a pretext to enable you to search my private property when you have no reason. That all strikes me as pretty reasonable and a pretty strong argument against um, uh, expanding the community caretaking function too, too, too far. So, comes under, you could say it comes under the second and fourth <laughs> of the Hawkins criteria, right? I mean, what, and, and, and that's why I, I raise this question. I mean, do, do you really think there's no significant privacy interest at stake when a woman gets arrested with a purse and brought down to the station and the police say, we're going to leave you You'll be here just for an hour or two, and then you'll go home. We're just booking you. And but while we're here, we're going to inventory your purse and look through everything that's in it. That doesn't bother you. So we don't disagree that Miss Larman maintains a privacy interest in the purse, but that's not the full question under Hawkins. The the question under Hawkins is interest balancing, and, and we don't. What interest? What interest do the police have in saying? You're just a visitor in the station for an hour. Let us look through your purse. Oh, I think I now understand your question. Once they go to, to search the purse at, in, 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 during the inventory at the station, at that point, we're not suggesting, I don't think we've advanced this argument, that at the time of the search, they're exercising their community caretaking function. We agree that at that point- No, they're exercising their inventory. They're saying, we're going to inventory it. That's correct. And, and the only reason they give really, since, the, since, since the purse is not going someplace where a weapon could be used against them, it's not going to the jail, for example, or what have you, the, the, under there at the time, at least they don't think so at the time they search it. Um, they're saying, well, we're just inventorying it so that nobody can, can claim that we stole anything from it. Now, that's a reason, I, I grant you, that's a, you know, it's a reason, but you think that's a good enough reason? under the Fourth Amendment that it's concerned about individual privacy? Absolutely. In every inventory search case, generally what we're talking about is some search or some other physical intrusion into what otherwise is a constitutionally protected area. But what those cases find- Well, those, but those cases tend to be different, I think, because there, the property in question is actually being uh, uh, in the care of the police or in the care of the jail or in the pr prison or whatever. And it's going to be there for some considerable length of time. And, or it's a car, for example, it's gonna be impounded. And um, there are reasons to inventory things. But when by hypothesis, this woman is just a visitor at the police station who is going to leave here in an hour, you don't think the calculus changes at all? I don't, for the simple fact that the officers have taken Ms. Larman's property into their exclusive possession. And if, if something were to happen, if some item were to go missing, Ms. Larman would have a, a legitimate grievance. Why, why, not ask her, why not ask her to sign a waiver, right? And say, look, we can either inventory it so that you can make sure that nothing gets stolen or sign a waiver, right? And I, I think I would sign the waiver. I, I would much rather not have the police go through my purse if I've just been pulled over for a traffic stop and I'm just getting a citation and I'm gonna leave in a couple of hours, right? That seems like a much better balance of interest, but but let's back up before the inventory search and talk about the seizure, right? Like, I mean, the, the same concerns that Judge Glickman are, is expressing, I have about the seizure. 
I don't understand why an adult who is not drunk as the officer was in Katie, right? Can't make a decision to say, okay, I'll come with you. I've got my license. You know, I've got a couple of bucks in my pocket. I'm going to leave all my bags here. I want to leave them here. I want to leave them in the car. I'll lock the car. I assume the risk, right? I do not want to take any of my personal possessions with me. Um, what, why, why can't I assert my privacy right? And why does the police interest in protecting my property for me, um, what, why is that balanced? Why does their seemingly paternalistic interest in protecting my property override my privacy rights? So I, I want to make sure I answer it as best as I can. It's our, we're not asking for a, a, a per se rule that in any situation, for example, I think this case is a lot different if Ms. Larman never raised the idea that this, this person in the front seat belonged to somebody else. And I think it's a lot different if the car that she was driving was registered to her, that she was the Well, only. can we stick with my hypothetical first, right? Well, so, so if I get arrested for running a stop sign and you find out that my license has been suspended and you say, we have to take your personal property with you. And I say, I don't want to take my personal property with me. I want to leave it in the car. And you say, well, the car could get broken into. And I say, I don't care. I assume the risk. Do you think that the person, the, the public, the community caretaking exception justifies the seizure of my purse? No. Okay. So then it seems like the salient facts are that the police didn't know that this purse belonged to um, Ms. Larman. Although they said they didn't suspect necessarily that it belonged to someone else. They didn't know that it didn't belong to her, if I can use that double negative, right? And what they did know was that she was in possession of it and she said, it's my sister's. So she has somebody else's property, presumably with their, with their permission. And she still says, I want to leave this property here, right? And, and that's really between her and her sister. If, if the property gets stolen, what's it to the police, right? So again, why does the police's interest in protecting either my or my sister's property interest override my privacy interest or my asserted privacy interest for my sister? So, so I, th I think the, the shortest answer, Your Honor, is that as law enforcement officers, uh, they, they have to exercise th their best judgment under the circumstances. And I think it, it's perfectly reasonable for the officers to look at purses that are sitting in plain view um, in a car that's going to be parked on the side of the road in an area where they testified that that is known for, for high incidences of auto theft, recognizing that Ms. Larman herself has raised this idea that that property belongs to somebody else. I think it's perfectly legitimate for the officers to weigh significantly the fact that, wait a minute, I know we've got two purses here. She says the one in the back seat is hers, but this purse belongs to somebody else who's not here, who's not here to take possession of it. We can't ensure the, the, the sort of the safety of that property. And so from an interest balancing standpoint, we think it's perfectly acceptable for the officers. They're not necessarily overriding her um, own desires. What they're thinking about are the desires of this other person. And, and in particular, this, I, other per I, this other person who entrusted this property to to her. Uh, right. Although there's, I mean, there's this no other person left that. left. Well, the, the police have no reason to believe that this property was not lawfully in her possession, right? That's correct. So she has, this, this property has been entrusted to her. And then she is making decisions for that property, right? Uh, she, she attempted to, I, I agree with that. She attempted to, and those, those decisions were disregarded. Uh, I would say they were taken into consideration and weighed against the, the competing um, interests. And I guess there's just one more interest that I want to make sure I flag, and is that this car, again, wasn't registered to Miss Larman. Um, and, and again, the, the owner of the car, there was no indication that in the, in the, in the time span of the, the seizure and taking her down to the station, that that person was going to be arriving anytime soon. And so in the context that these purses are sitting in plain view in a locked car, to the extent they're exposed to theft, 
the car itself is also exposed to potential, not theft, of course, but, but at least damage in an effort to gain access to those purses that are, again, have cash in them and are sitting in plain view. So, so our, well, our respect- they could have moved it out of plain view, maybe. Uh, but can I ask you about what, one of the other interests that's identified that at least arguably might apply in cases where, um, or back in the old days, might more have applied in cases where the arrestee is willing to say, no, I would rather have it left in the car, is that, you know, people may say that, uh, and then if something is stolen, they might say something different. And so you get litigation about what happened. Um, So there are some cases that identify that as an interest and say that suggests that sort of waiver by the arrestee doesn't avoid litigation because people, you know, there'll be factual disputes about whether there was or wasn't waiver, whether it was informed waiver waiver or some of those things. That consideration seems to me arguably less strong in cases like this one where there's body cam footage. So, you know, unlike some cases where it might be a suspect, you know, arrestee said, officer said dispute about what was supposed to happen with the property, there's a body cam that would, you know, would have allowed, if only Ms. Larman's interests were at stake, would have allowed the police to say, you know, Ms. Larman uh, made a choice. She decided she wanted to leave things there. We honored her choice. And you would think it'd be very difficult for Ms. Larman to actually successfully litigate, at least. Now, maybe the burden of litigation is itself a consideration. But do you think, to what extent do you think it's relevant to this consideration generally, at, but also in this case, that there's body cam footage that would establish that Ms. Larman's preference was to have these objects left in the car? So in order to fully answer that question, I think it would require a slightly deeper dive into the the civil side of of negligence and and property law um, and and sort of tort law as it relates to to law enforcement officers. I I do agree in terms of to the extent these purses were stolen and Ms. Larman wanted to sue the police department or or the district. Um, I think certainly the, the body worn camera that was on would present her with an uphill climb in the sense that Perhaps the government could argue that, well, she assumed the risk by doing that um, and and sort of offer that as an affirmative defense. But but I think you make a fair point, Judge McLeese. The burden and expense of litigation, uh, I think, is a relevant consideration. I don't think we can expect officers in real time to sort of project forward and say, well, what's the real civil liability here? I think the very idea that the decision to leave the purses sitting in plain view raises a a legitimate risk in their mind, regardless of what the ultimate outcome may be. I think that's a perfectly reasonable belief on the part of these officers under the circumstances. Um, I see- Are you you aware of any actual case law in this area involving cases like this in which a person sues the police for damages for you arrested me and you left my car on the street or you arrested me and you left my personal possessions in the car or similar situations. Have you found any case law on that? Uh, I'm not aware. It sounds like Judge McLeese and his last question may have identified some authority on that point, um, but, but I, I'm, I, I'm unaware of any. Um, well, we have extended your time at the podium quite I substantially. I say we, I take full responsibility. But no uh, problem. Um, thank you. And let us hear now thank you, from uh, 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 Mr. Hart. Uh, we'll give you a few minutes in rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I think it's, I think the, uh, I wish to thank the court for its time. It's good to see the court. And I think we'll submit. Okay. Uh, counsel, thank you both. The case is now submitted. Thank you, Your Honor. This court is now adjourned. And both counsel, by the way, may log out. Uh, Counsel, you can exit out.